Want to achieve network marketing success? Then you're in the right company. Hello, and welcome to Leave Nothing to Chance, hosted by networking marketing giant, John Solider. Learn everything you need to know about the network marketing space from somebody who's actually done it. Join us every week for front row seats as we feature some of the finest and most successful personalities in network marketing. Leave nothing to chance. Join us now. Well, week two, and, and ironically, this is airing right before American Thanksgiving, a couple of days before American Thanksgiving. This is kind of our Thanksgiving show, Bill. So welcome welcome to our, our first ever Thanksgiving show on Leaving Nothing to Chance. Well, I appreciate y'all including me on it, getting my microphone adjusted again here. It's always a pleasure speaking with you guys, and I thank you for having me. Well, well thank you, first of all, and, and, and uh, I want to ask you if we can double back to last week a little bit. Uh, with Reba at the Astrodome and you meeting her mom and talking about the song that you wrote for her. If you can tell that story. Actually, uh, she cut the song and released it in November of 1994, I believe it was, shortly around Thanksgiving time. I can't, I can't remember. But if you don't mind me saying a personal thing about it, I was taking my sons to school that morning and we knew it was out probably as a single, but we'd never heard it on the radio yet. So that was one of the things I was waiting on because I just couldn't wait to hear Reba sing, I saw it on the radio. So we're driving to school and it comes on, man. It was just like perfect timing. And, and the, the, the guy says, here's Reba McIntyre singing her new single. They asked about you. And my son, Billy says, dad, dad, she's singing our song. <laughs> Our song. <laughs> I love how they take ownership right away because it's part of the family. They knew how exciting it was. They weren't sure who she was, but they were only eight and ten years old. But they found out who she was because they got to go to her office, you know, and meet her that day. So, um, man, I got all sidetracked thinking of, of that that very thing there with with Reba and the song. But when the song ended, the disc jockey said, that's just like Reba. That caliber of that song is so incredible, like all the songs she picks. And so that was, I mean, there my sons are hearing what a great songwriter their daddy is from a disc jockey on the radio. And I love that part. I like that. I didn't solicit his, his uh, what do you call that, where they, they tell you, tell everybody how good you are because you can't. So, uh, but anyway, so we found out. It, Reba was going to be singing with uh, in the Astrodome at, I forget what date it was, but it was the next year after our song came out. We watched it climb the charts. Do you know that album that you're seeing back behind me on the wall, six weeks after it was released, it went number one. It went number one. And it was like, it's like, you almost like, oh my goodness, my dream has come true out of that. Goodness. Lord, thank you. Thank you. It was like, uh, and my, my, I love this part. My, my wife's grandfather told all of his friends, he, is, he was a, a pastor of a church in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, that he had started 40 years earlier, and it became one of the largest churches in that uh, religion that they had and started a school and everything. So he was telling all of his constituents, he said, my, my daughter, my daughter, uh, my granddaughter, Kimberly, as an office right next to Rebus in Nashville. Well, she didn't, although the writer's rooms were just down the hall. I know if, you don't, if you've never been to a writer's room at a publishing company, it's very, let me see, uninspiring. It's just a room. And, you know, we didn't even have, in her old offices, we had an office that didn't have a, a window to the outside, which is one of the things you learn to covet when you're writing songs. Is you can look out. And the birds are going on, and the trees, and the in the wind, or the white rain, or whatever's going on. But we just had a room and had a picture of a window. Had a picture of a window, and they said, "I hope you're happy with that." And we went, well, we had signed with Reba to write for her, by the way. In the meantime, after the song, the song was coming out. So uh, we flew home to watch Reba sing our song, and she also had had a huge hit on a song that most of your people will, will really be familiar with. It's called Does He Love You? And she did a duet with Linda Davis. And Linda turns out to be a great friend of ours. And and uh, to 
increase that trivia, her daughter ends up being a third of Lady Annabellum, the incredibly famous and popular singing uh, trio that, that wrote a song um, that, was, that was a huge song. They, they're, they're, just, they're just really great artists. And, and here, her little girl, Linda's little girl, when she was 10, they invited us to come bring Jimmy over to their apartment because they were doing a song. Linda's an incredible singer, by the way. If you ever listen to Does He Love You, she's the other woman voice that's singing with Reba, and she matches Reba on every note. I know it's hard to believe there's another woman alive that can sing like Reba, besides Dolly Parton, of course, but Dolly has a different style. But, man, these two women could sing, and so I think it's interesting that uh, Linda Davis's little girl turns out to be a huge star and she and Jimmy are friends from high school, grade school days, and even doing a song over at their house. So we became great friends with, with Linda and her husband. We played on the Reba McIntyre baseball team. I was a center fielder for the baseball team. And, uh, it, I was, it was just quite a fun year. And so uh, we go to Nashville. We, go to New, uh, we come back home to Houston. We fly in to see Reba in the Astrodome. And she and Linda... Just knocked it out of the park. I mean, our song, they asked about you. They did that, and they did, does he love you? And it just seemed like the crowd just was screaming and hollering more. And they got, you know how they do in the, the big arenas? They stop on the floor so loud that the whole place looks like, feels like it's going to shake and, and maybe collapse. But then they re-sang the songs, and it was just a, a, a moment in time we're sitting in the stands crying, and everybody else is, is having a great time. Why are these two people crying? It's because we've made it here to this level, and it was just something you never forget. And I thank God for that experience and that the fact that I never gave up hope, only a few times. So when people tell you they, they stuck it out through the whole thing, no, I didn't. I failed in my hope from time to time. I remember lay in my head. Oh, I'm going to cry now thinking about it. And my wife's lap on the couch in that home in Nashville. We were renting before we got the Reba hit. Then we bought the thing. Okay. But I'm laying there and they're like, oh, it's so bad. Oh, nothing's going right. Oh, my God. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm blubbering. And, and, and you know what? That really didn't do me any good. How, as I think back about it, it's like, you know, you wasted most of the morning doing that. Then when you tried to get going again, you were like really all uh, just trying to get going. Make yourself move. And then a year or so later, we're in the Astrodome listening to Reba McIntyre doing our song. And it was like, what a payment for that crazy moment. We've never forgotten it. And I've never done that again. Because I knew that, that that tells me, it's like they tell you, don't tell your own subconscious mind that you've lost or that you're no hope because your subconscious mind hears that and repeats it to you. What you say to it by faith is, hey, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I'm not down. I am not done. That, that one little chapter might be over, but I got something else. Where one door closes, another opens. And that's the truth. Really, uh, grab onto that. I mean, sometimes you don't want to be positive when a negative thing has happened to you. I, you know, it's like, don't tell me any positive. I want to be mad for the moment, you know. So you can do that, but it'll cost you. So I'm, I'm suggesting that you stay positive with it and just be quiet for a while. And go into a place that you know that God can meet you there. And say, Lord, please help me. I just need you. Encourage me, Lord. Send me something. Just give me a sign that I'm still going to make something happen. And something will happen. Somehow, invariably, something comes across that makes you realize that what's going on at, like at this time in our country, and we see all this stuff. I'm not going to categorize each thing and bring it all up. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. Hey, this too will pass. This too will pass. And all we got to do is we got to exercise our right to vote and quit telling these people that, that hate America, what are they doing in Congress? <laughs> if you hate America, you should not be allowed to be in our Congress. We love America. So 
there. I won't get into any more politics deeper than that. That's, a, that's, a, that's okay, because I feel the same way. But anyway, we, we'll, we'll save that for another show. Hey, you wrote, a, you wrote a song, I believe, In God We Still Trust by Diamond Real. Yes. Yes, it was quite an experience. And I'm, I would like to take the whole credit for it, of course. But we were writing on a project for someone, uh, and, and the, the project called for a patriotic song. But when you start trying to write a patriotic song, uh, all the would-be or wannabe or even songwriter, people that are songwriters, you'll know what we start going through, all the ideas. So you have what we call a, a session where everything is in. Any suggestion is in. Let's, let's, let's uh, run down that road for a minute, see if, we, if anything comes up. And we got to, you know, we got uh, in, uh, One Nation Under God, and uh, I forget, there's several other things. And then my wife said, on the dollar bill, it says, in God we trust. And she said, what about if we said, in God we still trust? And we all went, wow, <laughs> why not? She said, I believe I could write that. Well, what? What I didn't know at the moment, she was not only real idea, it came to her. When you have when you have an inspiration that comes over you, put it down on tape right then. Uh, you know, or write it down, whatever you have to do. And if you have a tune to it, learn the number system that goes with the tune. We're on an octave scale, so it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And they call eight the number of a new beginning because it's the same. One eight, that's the same note, only it's an octave apart. That's what you call that. An octave. It's a new beginning, the day of new beginnings. So she yeah, she started writing lines down and we, we adjourned for that session and we were, you know, we went on about our boy, the next couple of mornings at 2:30 in the morning, my wife's out there in the living room pounding on the piano. Bang, 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 bang. And I don't mean playing. I mean, bang, 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 bang. That's her style of playing. <laughs> that's how she plays. So, so I, I said, Kim, that's really loud. Uh, it's really good at being loud. I'm not sure how what the technique is. It is a bang, bang, bang. But she was pounding out the tune to In God We Still Trust. And she had some words written down. And, and she was the next morning when I got up, she got up about noon because she stayed up most of the night writing on that song. And she passed these words by me. And I think I had a suggestion for two or three words, but she wrote, when our founding fathers bravely formed this nation, they spoke of him as our creator as they wrote their declaration. He was there from the beginning. That's how we've come this far. Our faith in him throughout our history made us who we are. And I went, Whoa! Yeah! Man! So, I just wrap it all up like we made a demo of it, and we presented it to my friend Ray Pillow, who was on the Grand Ole Opry for 52, three years before, 52 to three, 53 years, before he finally retired, and he is battling Alzheimer's at the moment, and uh, we, we talked on the phone here a couple of months ago, and we just all, you know what he did? We went to Nashville. And uh, George Morgan has a, a daughter, and uh, uh, her name, is, her last name is Morgan, her first stage name. Now I'm trying to think of her first name. Doggone it, I got myself in a jam here. But maybe your constituents out there will know. Lori Morgan, Lori Morgan. So we go to, she had a hot chicken place in Nashville that she had created. She was in the restaurant business for a moment, as well as being on the Grand Ole Opry, as, be, as well as being an RCA recording artist. And her daddy, George Morgan, I had known him from when my family was singing gospel music on Columbia Records because he was on Columbia, and me and him got to sit next to each other in the green room and talk to each other. And I had a picture of me and him, and I gave it to Lori. And so we were eating lunch at her place, and after lunch, we, we Ray and his wife went to leave, and, and I said, Ray, here's this song I want you to listen to. So he starts his car, and he puts the tape in. And I, you, that dates me right there, cassette tapes. This was nine. This was I don't know what year this was. Nineteen ninety, two thousand year two thousand something like that. Okay, so anyway, we leave out of the parking lot, and I came out this way, and he was already out that way. And then he starts honking his horn, and he had his red window rolled down. He's waving his arm out the window. It's like, what does he want? So that was before cell phones. 
So we get back, we get to where we're going. I called him and said, he, I said, what? He said, Bill, this song. Oh, my God, I want to pitch this. I said, please pitch it to whoever you want. So this is what an interesting story, John. People always picture in the Elvis Presley movies how they would present a song to Elvis, and everybody's in a coat and tie. They're in a business office, and it's this and that. Do you know none of that is true? Ray Pillow calls up Marty Rowe of the group Diamond Reel. Hey, Marty, let's play golf. Oh, Marty's a big golfer, and so is Ray Pillow. Okay, what do you want to do? He said, I'll meet you at the Waffle House. So they meet at the Waffle House. They go in, they're having waffles and, and blabber and stuff. And when they go outside, Ray says, uh, hey, Marty, come on over to my car. I got to play you a song. But he puts him in the car in the front seat. And there they are. And he plays, in God we still trust here in America. And, and, and uh, Ray Pillow told me, he said that, that Marty had his head in his hands. Thinking and looking. And when the song ended, he didn't raise his head up. He's still sitting there with his head in his hands. And Ray's looking at him. He says, well, Marty, what do you think? And he, is it good? Is it any good? He's, and he looks up and he says, Ray, it's great. And Ray was like, ah, I did good. Well, it ended up on their album, their last album for RCA Records. This never happens, by the way. They put the record out and we even still have a Tom Baber on the Grand Ole Opry and introduced the song to America. And they said that there was some pushback from some of the, I don't know who they are that don't believe in America and don't love God. Some people, you know, and, and Marty explained it. He said, that it's their right to do what they think. But man, we had an onslaught of people that loved this song. They loved it so much. And Marty and the guys were closing their show with it then, and they never failed to get a standing ovation for the song. So they got signed to Word Records because their RCA days contract was over, and they went right to Word, which is a Christian uh, label. And they re-recorded in God We Still Trust. That never happens, but they did it because they still close their shows with it. And there's been several videos. It's been recorded now 50-some-odd times. Just go uh, go to YouTube or Google and Google in God we still trust. And you'll see there's so many people that have cut this song from the Christian world to the country world. to the patriotic things. They still fly Kim and me around the country to sing at special deals for veterans. And we've used this song innumerable times. And we've just found such great acceptance. It's been a viral hit three times. Around the world, around the world, and it'll rest for a couple of months. It'll go around the world, around the world. And but, hey, this is the funniest story. The guy that was our our uh, inter, interface in Nashville at the first publishing deal, but we call him the guy that taught us to write songs. Uh, Jerry Taylor, who's no longer with us. God bless your soul, Jerry. But uh, Jerry sent us a video of Diamond Rail doing our song, and he said, Bill and Kim, you've just got to hear this song. <laughs> he didn't know we were the writers. And we sent him back, Jerry, you know, you right? You should have known that was part of your work. We wrote this song and he went, Oh my God. It was one of those I had to share it with you guys. So so let's play word association for a couple minutes, okay? <laughs> because you've known so many people, and we're gonna miss a bunch, but a couple of people that to, to me are just iconic to say the least. Johnny Cash. I know you knew knew Mr. Cash. What kind of guy was he? When I was with my family, the Nash Family Trio on Columbia Records, we uh, we were sent to New York. We were sent from New York. Our first album was made in New York with Perry Como's producer Ernie Altshuler. And he he said he said to my mom because I was only fourteen years old, and he said to my mom who was heading us up at the time, my brother was eighteen. I'm going to send y'all to Nashville for your next album. And Johnny Cash's producer, Mr. Don Law. He, I think he'll understand gospel music better because that, that country music and gospel music is so tightly intertwined. And in fact, Johnny Cash used to put a gospel song on every album of his that went out to the world. I don't know if you guys knew that, but that was one of the things he did. So they put us with Don Law, and we go to Nashville to record. At the same time, we we're having the disc jockey convention in those days. And so... Uh, the first time I ever met Johnny Cash for real, I was at, we were staying in the same hotel he was for this convention in Nashville. And I'm not sure where he was living at the time, but he was staying at this hotel. And the elevator doors opened, and Johnny was about six foot one. 
And I was only five, seven, 135 pounds at 14, 15 years old. And then there's Johnny Cash. And he still had on a tuxedo shirt and a jacket with that long jacket he wore. And he said, uh, he, the elevator doors open and, and there I am starstruck standing there. He said, uh, how you doing? I said, uh, uh, I'm doing great. I'm doing great. How you doing? I'm uh, doing fine. And he walked on life so friendly. So according you thought we'd have known each other all our lives. But the next day at the Ramen Auditorium, which is where they do the, the uh, Grand Ole Opry, in those days, they didn't have Opry Land at the time. This was the Ramen. And I'm standing backstage, and we had opened the show. The Nash Family Trio opened the show, and Johnny Cash was the closer. And they had all the other country acts So Marty Robbins was part of that opening act. I mean, my goodness goodness when you open for guys like that and i didn't really know who they were at that time as much as maybe i should have but i was so steeped in gospel music i didn't really listen to country music i was listening to rock and roll and gospel but marty bled over when he did el paso it crossed over the country lines to the pop lines to all across radio so five million singles in a day when a country artist if he sold five uh, fifty thousand singles it was a number one hit record that was the difference in a pop singer and a country singer. But Marty uh, passed over that. Johnny Cash did too with I Walk the Line. That be, Johnny wrote that song as well. And it crossed over the country line into the rock and roll world. It was a number one and on and on. So that day, the whole audience is out there waiting for Johnny Cash. And I'm standing right beside him backstage. And our producer, Don Law, is on the other side of Johnny. And Jim Carter's in the mix there with us. And I'm just standing there. I keep looking up at Johnny, and there's Jean. She was such a pretty gal. She was so sweet to all of us and uh, waiting on him. Now, do you want to hear a real inside story? It's in my book, by the way. I have a show you my book. My book's over here. Everybody get my book. So in this book, there's a story. I'm sitting there. I'm standing there by Johnny. Now, the MC of the show is Carl Smith. And the people that really know country music are going to know who Carl Smith is. He was an artist from Columbia Records as well. But he was emceeing this whole show. And they did a, no, a whole album. I've got it hanging on my wall over here somewhere of 12 Columbia recording artists from Johnny Cash, Marty Robbins, Chuck Wagon Gang, uh, Carl Perk. No, not Carl Perkins. Uh, uh, anyway, on and on and on. There's 12, and we're part of that 12. We're on that album with all these stars, man. It was like, like so cool. And so Carl Smith, and here's the back, back story. Carl Smith used to be married to Johnny Cash's then wife, June Carter. He married, she and him were married first and divorced. Imagine that, a couple in show business divorcing. Oh, my God. Shocking. So, right? <laughs> yeah, shocking. So Smith is looking over at all of us standing in the wings on this big old Grand Ole Opry stage. We're over there in the wings waiting for him to introduce Johnny Cash. So he says to the crowd, he, he knew what he was doing, believe me, because here now June Carter, his ex-wife, is now married to Johnny Gass. They're standing over there together. And he says, well, and he made a smart, smart a, a comment. He said, I had it before he did. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, no. Carl, Johnny Cash took off like a shot and headed toward Carl. Carl expected it, believe me. He knew what was going to happen. But he was center stage. Johnny's in the way. Here comes Johnny. Carl Smith takes off and runs around to that side of the stage. And Johnny Cash is in hot pursuit. And they chase each other around this whole circumference of the stage. And the crowd, the, all the disc jockeys are going, what's happening? What's happening? What's happening? <laughs> Johnny never could catch Carl because Carl was the smaller guy and faster. And God, he was because Johnny would have knocked him from eternity. But we were laughing over there. After a while, we realized what went on, and it's like, oh, duh. I, you know what a moment! It's in my book. You know, you, you know, Bill. The the, the greatest part, and, and, and keep the greatest part of doing these podcasts are the backstories on stuff. Because like like that, I mean, that's just like the stuff you're never going to see or hear unless you're really part of it. So, 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 so let me let me ask you about about another guy who I mentioned to you yesterday, who I think is was such a a giant, uh, Roy Orbison. Uh, yeah, 
Well, you know what? I never got to meet Roy, and uh, I really wanted to. The closest I ever got to Roy was my mom and I were walking down the streets of Nashville. About that same time, we were, we'd done this convention. And here goes Roy Orbison driving by in a brand-new Cadillac, white Cadillac, and he had a shirt in the back window hanging up there. And on the back of it, it had um, the record label that he was on. And I'm not sure how that cat, but that's how I knew it. And, of course, you, could, you couldn't miss Roy. He He's, he's a different-looking kind of guy. He didn't, doesn't look like a star. But, man, the guy was such a great singer. They, they counted him because he had an operatic country voice. I don't even know if you can put those two terms together, opera and country. But he did. And he wrote all of his hit songs, too. He was a writer. He was a writer's writer. But it took a voice like his, you know, just run and scared each place we go. And then the hook line, he turned around and walked away. She turned around and walked away with me. You know, and the whole thing goes out through the roof. But what's interesting, and let me give you all a, a little uh, insight. The guitar player on Roy Orbison's album singles all those like the, you know, the lick that you hear on Pretty Woman? That was Jerry Kennedy, my producer at Mercury Records. Is that right? Wow. Was an incredible guitar player. And so that was that was Jerry Kennedy. And Jerry Kennedy toured with Roy uh, in Europe some sometimes when he went. And so, uh, actually, Jerry Kennedy named one of his sons after the record producer, Shelby Singleton, was a very famous record producer. And Shelby uh, had some of the songs that went there. But, you know, David, Jerry Foster was a writer we wrote with. Right, Foster and Rice, if you Google those two guys, they were some of the biggest, most successful songwriters of all time. And we wrote with, uh, not Jerry, Jer we wrote with Jerry Foster. And uh, I'm trying to think of Roy Orbison's producer's name. His last name is Foster. And it's Stephen Foster's heritage. Stephen Foster from the 1800s that wrote uh, one of my favorite songs of all, of all time. And Roy Orbison recorded it. And I'm trying to think of the name of it, you guys. I'm getting myself in a, in a mix here. But that's who produced Roy Orbison. And uh, so I, I'm, I'm sorry uh, to the audience. I apologize. My brain, my brain is thinking a million miles a minute because I know it was Foster, his last name that produced. And Stephen Foster wrote this most beautiful song. I'm trying to think of da, 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 da. If I think of it, do you mind if I say it to you in a few minutes? Uh, no, no, no problem. So, so let me let me ask you about two other guys before I forget. Okay, and this is so funny because we talked about this yesterday. And before I'm on AOL, and for the third time in a week, Perry Como's name pops up, right? Who some of our younger audience aren't going to remember Perry Como, but I, I grew up on his Christmas show. I knew it was Christmas time when, right after Thanksgiving, the Perry Como Christmas special every year for I don't yes. know how many how many years. But yeah, uh, when I was young, yes, you know. But uh, I, I mean, I know you you knew him a little bit as well. Yeah, well, I, actually, I met his record producer, Ernie Altshuler, in New York, and that's who did our first album. So I never really got to meet Perry in person, but I loved his singing. You know, one of the most beautiful songs that Perry Como ever did is called It's Impossible. It's impossible, ask the sun to leave the sky, it's just impossible. And that song is actually a song that was first a song in Spanish. Uh, somos novios. Somos novios in Spanish means we are boyfriend girlfriend, and they that melody was so beautiful. Then it got rewritten in English, and Perry Como then sang it. It was a huge hit for Perry, and I did it on uh, one of the. I was I was still hosting a, a television show in Philadelphia at WCAU with Betty Hughes. She was Richard Hughes's wife, and Richard Hughes was the governor of New Jersey, where he was from. In those days, that'd be about 1970. Mm -hmm. So I, I was on that TV show for that. It was a summertime show, and I was there for the whole summer. And that's where I learned about, though I got there earlier, it lasted into the summer. That's right. I started in January, and I had never lived in snow and ice and gloves and layering. I, I had to learn to layer. All I had was a, like a 
a, a jacket that you wear on tour, a tour jacket of somebody. And when it was 28 degrees outside in Philly, oh my God, it made your bones hurt to hit that cold air. So I'd be on my way to the TV station. I shook all the way because my car went, we didn't, I didn't live that far from there. And it barely got warmed up in time to get to the station. I came in, my teeth were chattered. I remember my producer saying, you've got to get yourself some winter clothes. So <laughs> they thought me. My name was Michael Brennan, by the way, at that time, because I had signed with Capitol Records after being on Columbia with Gospel or Mercury with Country. They were trying to get me to be a whole new artist as a pop artist. And the same guy that wrote Johnny Mathis, my uh, chances are... Yeah, that, that, you know, I, I make up, I made up my own words to chances are. You want to hear it? Chances are when you smoke a big cigar, your car will smell just like cigar. <laughs> your chances are awfully good. <laughs> I'm sorry for the corn and for you know, the, uh, uh -huh. the very corn, but I love it, man. But wait a minute. Thinking about corn, okay? Hold him under preacher. <laughs> Yeah, man, what a song! You've got the you've got the CD with that on there, Keith. You have a little bit of an advantage over John because he doesn't have that. But there's a song I'd, I'd, uh, that I have to. I don't know whether to tell you the words to it first and then tell you the reaction that my wife had to us not recording it. And the songwriter who is his name is Don Goodman, and Goodman's got a page. He's got three pages of what we call a discography, meaning. This is who cut this song. This is who cut this song. This is who cut this song. And uh, I'm thinking, uh, my wife just told, I asked her his name just uh, again. He's on, he's on one of the big, one of those talent shows now. He's on The Voice, I believe. Oh, yeah. He's Ada, Oklahoma. What's that guy? Blake Shelton. Blake Shelton. This was before Blake was a, a big star. He'd come into Nashville of course, he's six foot two and he's handsome as all get out and he can sing and he's so talented and all and up. And his first song, his, his, this is funny. So Don Goodman, oh man, I'm telling y'all about another song, I, but I got mixed up into it thinking of, of Hold Him Under because Don Goodman also wrote this song called Hold Him Under and pitched it to us. So let me just go with that. If you want to hear the Blake Shelton story, I'll tell that to you in a little bit. We wrote, we wrote a lot of songs for Don Goodman because he really liked our writing, and, and I, I, we're so blessed to have done so. So one day, Goodman's at our house. He says, Bill, Bill and Kim, I just got to play all this song. It, we, me and um, he was sitting waiting to do a, a demo session at a studio, and they got bored. And this happens sometimes. The guys that are in there recording before you get there, they, they get hung up, and so it takes a little longer. So it, it says... It was neath an old brush arbor. One stormy summer night, lightning cracked and I jumped back. I thought I'd seen the light. Well, I commenced a hollering, wash my sins away. And as my head went neath the water, I heard my mama say, hold him under just a little bit longer. Preacher, stand on his throat and don't let him up till his feet start to flow. And if he hollers, hey! Yeah, he's just telling one more lie, preacher. Hold him under till he's over on the other side. Well, that's the first verse. Goodman finished the song. My wife said, no, no, we're not recording that one. Man, no, yeah. And our friend that helped us get started with Champion Skid Camp in Houston was with us at the time. He said, oh, you got to cut that. you got to cut that. We cut it. Do you know it's our most requested song of all time? I believe it. I believe that, that version of it. Well, Bill, let me let me ask you. Okay, we we, we talked about Champions Kids Network uh, or uh, Champions Kids uh, Camp uh, a little bit on the prior show, um, and I know uh, by the time this airs, you will have had your big annual golf event. Um, but one of the guests there is a uh, interesting guy in his own right who you've been working with, uh, Mr. Uh, Termite Watkins. You want to tell us a little bit about Termite? I can. Uh, when Termite was born, his dad owned an extermination company, exterminating, you know, you know, uh, ass and roaches and mice and rats and all that. So when the, when the Termite was born, his dad just, his real name is Maurice. That, you know, but his dad called him Termite. And it was like, as Termite got older, he liked it. 
And nobody knows why, but, you know, as he became a boxer, he was the youngest uh, boxer in history to, I forget, I forget what, there's some stats on him that I wish I, I wish I had brought down here with me. But he fought for the world championship uh, in a double main event with Muhammad Ali and the guy Muhammad was fighting for the world championship of the heavyweight division and Termite was fighting for the lightweight division championship. And they went the full 15 rounds and neither one knocked the other one out and it was on points and it was so close, like, I don't know, like, uh, just so close. And half the country thinks that Termites, they still think Termite won that fight. Because out of his 68 professional fights, he knocked out 58 of his opponents. And that's unusual for a lightweight. So Termite had quite a career and on and on. And he eventually, after that fight, I think he retired after then. And he went back into the family business with his dad, exterminating. And the federal government, you know, when you get that famous, people know who you are. They called him and they said, would you go to Iraq? Now we're in the middle of the Iraqi war. We've got an air base there that's got a problem with mice and rats. And all. Would you go take care of that problem? And I'm not sure he had told me the story. I'm, I'm, not, I'm trying to remember how it came about. But they, they also asked him, they said, we want to send you a group of 20 Iraqi men. And I want you to, they want you to teach them to box. And we want you to do your best to get them in the Olympics. Well, first of all, to take guys that are already grown and haven't been raised in boxing, how do you treat, how do you teach them that to a, a skill level that they could compete? And secondly, how do you get them in the Olympics? Oh my gosh, you know, we've already, we got a peace thing going on with Iraq, et cetera, et cetera. So it was a goodwill thing. But do you know that he did that? He had 20 guys that he taught to box, and he got them in the Olympics through his, through his rapport with the federal government and, and with the Olympic Committee. So he is very well touted. And, and in the interim period, when he got to boxing, you know, as a child, he was raised in church. But he got away from God, kind of like my story. And through all those years, he got into drugs and alcohol and he wasted, he spent so much money on nose candy, let's call it, and on and on. But he is now, he's got a boxing gym behind the church that he works with as a co, co uh, a minister there. And he has take, taken so many of those kids, those young boys that come to their gym to learn to box, they're in gangs. In that little, in that short part of Houston where he's at, there's a gang on that corner, a gang on that corner, and a gang on the other corner. And he's won so many of them to the Lord. And they have an unspoken word. When you go to termites, boxing gym, you do not take your guns. You do not fight. And you do not get in any kind of altercation. It's peace. It's a, they, and they enter the gates with that at his gym. And so what's happened is Sylvester Stallone, has come along and said, Termite, we need to make a movie of your life. And he just signed the deal uh, this past month. Now they're going to make a full length, full feature motion picture of his life. And I've already submitted a song for them to use for his title song, like the Rocky theme. And it's called Balboa Productions. Can you imagine where did they get the name Balboa? Maybe from Rocky Balboa, right? So that's Sly Stone's company, and it's going to be a big deal in about a year and a half. They just started, the, the script writers have asked for an extra more, one more month to finish the script because there's so much to get to. His career spans so many years. He was such a great fighter, and now he just loves people, and he loves kids. So he's going to be bringing some of his people to our Champions Kids Camp, and we're going to be bringing some of our kids that would like to learn to box to his uh, boxing ring. And the boxing ring that he has in his gymnasium is the one that Muhammad Ali fought his last title fight, title fight in Houston in. And when the fight was over, they gave the, the entire ring to sit, to, and I'll sit still, this is just on, to uh, Termite, Termite Watkins. He has it down there in his gym. So I got pictures with him in that ring. And it's just been a great, fun thing. And he invited me to his uh, 
indoor golf tournament this past Friday to be one of the celebs there. And I got to meet a couple of guys, but one of the, you know, the Globetrotters, when I was a little boy, man, that was something to watch the Globetrotters. I got to meet, his last name is Dixon, Airman Dixon. And I can't think of his first name now, but that's who I got to meet, and I got a picture with him. And man, I was like, I was starstruck there. Hey, yo, man, can I get a picture with you? And now I've got a phone. I've got a phone with a camera in it. I missed Lucille Ball at, when I was co-hosting Steve Allen. I didn't get a picture with her, and she kissed me on my forehead and told me what a great singer she thought I was. I didn't have enough sense to tell her, can I come audition for some of your shows that you're doing at Desilu? <laughs> oh, man. I, let that be a lesson to you. Get a picture of whoever. If the janitor comes to pitch you a song, get a picture of him. <laughs> of him. He may turn out to be Chris Christofferson. Wow. Well, I, I, I can't think of a better place to kind of – wrap up than, than there bill we, we could go we could go on for, for, for days with these stories but uh i want to thank i want to thank you again hey the name of our show leaving nothing to chance every tuesday on uh, apple and spotify and itunes and www.leaving nothing to chance titles of our books one of which i wrote with uh, keith hooper i'll turn the call back to here in a second uh called uh, moving up 2020 it's an amazon bestseller and then of course uh, most recently uh leave nothing to chance and uh, all are available in spanish and english and bill once again i just want to thank you this has been incredible and just uh continued success you're you're blessing so many people still at 77 you're going strong and uh i know you're into physical fitness uh I, and i know your wife is waiting to take a walk with you i know this afternoon so we better not, better not hold kim up too much longer but uh, no, you didn't go to me up at all. And uh, I just put your book in the mail, by the way, John. You're going to get it tomorrow. Thank you so much. I, get, I put a couple of music CDs in there as well. Over the years, we have some music CDs that we still have. And we still, now people don't have CD players much in their cars anymore like they used to. But you, downloads are what we go with. And you can go to our website, championskidscamp.org, and it'll have information on us. Or our personal website is BK, like Bill Kim, BK Nash. Dot com where you can see Reba McIntyre doing uh, uh, one of our songs. You see Dolly Parton and Wayne Newton and 20 other country stars, Larry Gatlin and I don't know, doing the song we're part of. And then Diamond Rio's video there of In God We Still Trust, as well as our own video of it. You can check out all those things. I appreciate anybody that would be interested in sponsoring a kid to camp. It's 500 bucks to sponsor a kid to our summer camp, which is coming up July 24th, this coming year through the 25th, through the 29th. We will be at Carolina Creek Christian Camp with probably a couple of hundred kids that have been through trauma and 50 volunteers. So you can see what my life's work is now. And I give myself to, to Jesus Christ and to my Father God to help children that have been through trauma. Well, Bill, you, you, you're doing some amazing stuff. Not, not only have you had an inspiring career and beautiful music and so many artists, but uh, what you're doing for these kids is special. And it's unique. And uh, I know you're doing God's work, but uh, continued great health, success. And uh, Keith, I'll turn it to you for a second here for a closing thought. Uh, just a closing thought is go to championskidscamp.com and maybe you can't do $500 to, to, to support a, a kid yourself, but you can you can send $20 or $5, Amen. whatever it happens to be. But you can make a difference. You know, that's why we're in network marketing. That's why John is doing these calls. You know, John Solver is doing leave, leaving nothing to chance because it makes a difference. Bill Nash is doing what he's doing and his lovely bride, Kim, his child bride, Kim, kind of teasing. And uh, they're, that's what they're doing. And they've made a, such a huge difference. But so can you. So that $5 could be the difference, you know, between one more kid coming to camp. So don't 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 limit yourself. You know, if, if $5 is what you can do, get there, get some of Bill's music, get his book. You know, uh, hold that book up again there, Bill, real quick, because uh, the title is true. <laughs> the title is true. So thank you, Bill Dash. Appreciate you very much, my friend. Yeah, thank you, Keith, for introducing me to John. I appreciate it. And I look forward to us being friends, John, as long as Keith and I now have another 20 years wouldn't hurt us at all. Yeah, well, I'm looking forward to it, Bill. And uh, we're, 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 we're just starting. So uh, continue good help. Thanks so much. Fantastic. God bless y'all, and thanks for having me on. I'm very honored. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Leave Nothing to Chance. 
If you want to know more about what it takes to succeed in the network marketing space, join us again next week for another amazing episode. For additional resources and to connect with John Soliter, visit leavingnothingtochance.com. Don't forget to leave a review, and we'll see you next time.